Okay. Kind of our last uh, major presentation is dealing with com mass computation. And I think I asked before, but how many have had in high school or anywhere have had to deal with a mass confrontation? I've had two. I had one. Yes, we're going to talk about your one. So <laughs> this is going to be kind of a uh, you know, multiple, you know, share a little bit of your experiences and, and lessons learned from yours if you remember it, because most of us, if we've been through a mass confrontation, we tend not to forget it. Uh, we may not forget, we may not remember the details and everything, but there are some key takeaways that almost all of us will learn uh, in the mass confrontation. So, this can happen in your game. You can see the plane was moving forward, but for a split second, the two players' feet get tangled up, sending the Louisville player, 18-year-old Annette McCullough, tumbling to the ground. But then just as fast as she hits the ground, she pops back up. Three Alan Parker coach is moving in quickly, but the player seems to not be up, switching handholds of the hair and dragging the Chester player for a bit. She, she had to switch hands so she could get more leverage, all right? So, uh, all right. So, we saw a coach run over there because that's just happened to be where the angle of the, the cliff was, but you kind of wonder, okay, where was the referee? And where was the assistant referee? And, you know, getting over there because that was about maybe a 10 second clip. So, we'll, we'll be talking about mass confrontation in a moment. There's some key takeaways. Wayne. Uh, yeah, that's my question. That's not really a mass confrontation. Not yet. That's uh, yes. that's called yeah. game and disrepute when it involves two players and no no other players. So that's not quite yet mass confrontation. But this is in Rhode Island. No sound. So they're both kind of backing off. And now, now watch the referee. Sir, you got the ref. So, what do you think the referee should have done in that one? He was probably blowing the whistle and probably should have gotten there, but as soon as he started getting surrounded, he probably should have backed out and just try to see what's going to happen next. Take numbers. Take numbers. Yeah, I know. Take numbers. That's that's one of the things that they'll tell you. We'll talk about uh, you know the triangle of control. This next one, some of you that have been here before have seen this clip from Minnesota. Uh, it's it's going to be it's a 21 minute clip and it's it's really informative. It's a semifinal match uh, on the biggest uh, the highest high school division, and I'll let the guy do the talk. It's about uh, 21. This clip is from the very end of the Section 5A boys title match. For those of you who haven't seen it, let's watch the clip first. Then we'll get a little deeper into the whys and hows. So this guy's doing the throw in from here. This is a type of player. Is this a three man whistle? Or a, this is three man. Whistle? Yeah. Here's this one was That's the referee. And Carrera is seeing the number one seed is going to survive. Oh, now we get a little bit of a twist at the end. Oh. living together mass hysteria don't just happen out of the blue. In fact, there are numerous incidents from this match that kept adding sparks to the pile of dry brush. And when that brush finally caught fire, well, it kind of went up in a true full-fledged conflagration. We're going to show a few incidents from during this match first and discuss them briefly. The first game-critical moment occurs in the 12th minute with a restart after an injury. High school soccer has a modification to the traditional USSF rules in which if one team appears to have clear possession of the ball at the time of an injury stoppage, that team is awarded an indirect free kick at the location of the ball when play is stopped. 
per high school rules in this situation, the restart would be an indirect free kick for White about 5 to 10 yards inside its own half. Now watch, and more importantly, listen to the restart and the ensuing result. So that's just kind of walking it off. I wonder if the, the referee's going to tell them that they have to bring them out. This happens at all levels, not just high school, 
and it is an essential part of the pregame for the referee crew to discuss how they're going to handle this potential situation. When the referee is caught out of position on a counterattack, we need the assistant referee to be empowered to expand his or her area of control. This does not mean that, from his limited position on the touchline, he's necessarily going to be able to see a foul here. But we need to make sure that the assistant referee is comfortable in knowing that he can make this call if he sees it. This requires a pregame discussion that includes the discussion of handling rapid counterattacks and a deliberate effort by both the referee and the assistant referee at this time to make eye contact during the play. Both officials should sense the possibility of a foul here, and the referee should be making eye contact to the assistant looking for help. The assistant should sense something and look at the referee to see if the referee needs help. In order to prepare for this potential situation, it needs to be discussed in the pregame meeting. The end result here, the tying goal, is a game-critical moment. Television views and replays provide angles that the referee crew did not have, and these angles suggest that there was likely a foul here. The focus here should not be that the referee crew might have gotten the call wrong, but rather how the referee crew might have been better prepared to see something which on TV looked mildly obvious. The next important event in this match comes in the second half. A blue player has a shot at a 50-50 through ball with the white goalkeeper coming out. The two players come together on the ground and the blue forward catches the white goalkeeper, injuring him. We again have the issue of a quick ball being played through. Remember a few podcasts ago where we showed a clip from an MLS match in which Edvin Jurcevic took a wide line leaving himself well behind the play but gaining a vantage point that allowed him to see the space between the players. That's what needs to happen here. A better angle, even from a greater distance, would allow the referee to see the blue player come in with the studs exposed, the knee locked, and commit what is a foul that could be regarded as serious foul play. Please understand outfield players have the right to go for loose balls, but if an outfield player lunges in with the studs exposed and the knee locked on an opposing outfield player who is upright, as referees we're often going to be very sensitive to the prospect of serious foul play. We need to apply a similar, if not even more protective principle when the goalkeeper is involved, because oftentimes the goalkeeper's head will be near the ball. This challenge is something. We're not going to say it should have been a red card or even that it should have been a yellow card, but it is a moment of truth in this match. This is the referee's opportunity to draw a line in the sand of how physical this match will be moving forward. No card is given here, and there isn't even a foul call. Maybe that's a calculated risk on the referee's part, but considering the prior moments of truth discussed in other events which haven't been covered in these videos, and their potential effect on this match, now is not the time to be tolerant of this kind of challenge. The final incident leading to the end of the match Donnybrook is White's lead-taking goal, which occurs with just a few minutes left in regulation. This goal is scored fairly and without controversy, unlike the match's first two goals, but it's the timing of this goal which takes all of the emotional roller coaster moments from the first 78 minutes of this match, many of which we haven't even shown here, and turns it into the spark for the fire. After the goal, we get a series of incidents showing that this thing is about to blow up. At 1.45, a desperate blue attacker thoughtlessly shoves a white player to the ground inside White's penalty area. The white player, number 11, gets up and immediately gets in the face of the blue player. This is game disrepute and is the first sign that we may have problems developing. 20 seconds after the restart, one of the white attackers runs down a blue defender from behind. The junior assistant is quick to call the foul and give blue a free kick. The blue defender and white attacker exchange words and the blue player gives the attacker a rather unfriendly shove. Two fouls since the lead taking goal. Blue heaves the ball forward from the restart. A white defender pursues the ball into the corner and goes down under a physical challenge that the referee decides is not a foul. One of the white defenders is seen visually dissenting the lack of a call. That's three challenges. About 20 seconds later, the game-winning goal scorer in possession near the touchline is killing clock and he's double teamed. He plays the ball back to a teammate and after he releases the ball is subjected to a cheap shove to the upper chest and neck region well after the ball is gone. In just 90 seconds of game time after the game-breaking goal, that's no less than four incidents that have added temperature to this match. As a crew, we need to see this, recognize it, and raise our guard. 
You can see all the warning signs that something could blow up in the final minutes of this match. It doesn't mean that any of the ensuing violent conduct was necessarily preventable because sometimes players don't respond to our traditional methods of player management. But the entire point of this exercise to this point is to show that the dots connect. Yes, we're going to talk about managing mass confrontation, but in a perfect world, we never have to deal with mass confrontation. If that's our real goal, we need to understand what creates frustration and learn to recognize these moments in a match as key moments of truth that, if dealt with properly, keep the match temperature from ever boiling over. Okay, so now let's get to the main event. The referee properly stops the clock with five seconds left to allow an attacking throw-in. In a USSF match, we would simply add time. The ball is thrown into the white penalty area, then cleared. In front of the referee, but off the ball, there is an innocuous appearing collision between two players, at which point the white player turns and throws a punch at the blue player who bumped him in the back. This is our first clear case of violent conduct, and at this point we do not have mass confrontation, but rather game disrepute. Mass confrontation involves three or more players. The key in understanding this difference is that it's possible for a referee or a member of the crew to prevent game disrepute from escalating into mass confrontation. Once things blow up, no referee or crew is going to put a halt to the ensuing proceedings. The message is that while this remains an incident of game disrepute, as an official you have a chance to keep this from getting worse, but you need to recognize it and become the third man into the fray. Most game disrepute situations typically involve a lot of talk, chest bumping, intimidation, and so forth. Rarely, you can see game disrepute involve violent conduct, as happened here. If the referee can safely get between and separate the players, that's usually as far as it will go. You can deal with unsporting behavior, foul or abusive language, even violent conduct, once you have everybody separated and there's no more worry for things flaring up again. But you need to make sure that there's little to no chance of that happening, and that means getting in between the players and getting them apart. In this situation, the assistant referee has the best chance to do this at this moment. But you need to recognize who the two parties are and separate them. As the AR comes in, his arms are properly extended to create space, but he fails to restrain the two players involved in the disrepute, number 11 for white and number 2 for blue. In fact, he's separating number 11 white from number 6 blue. And you can see from number 6's body language, he's not looking to engage in fighting. Number 6's hands are up in a relaxed, easy posture. Meanwhile, number 2 for blue circles around behind the assistant referee and then proceeds to assault number 11 for white. The white goalkeeper, remember him, the victim of that studs up challenge, comes in from behind, pushes the assistant referee out of the way, and then begins wildly punching both blue number two and the blue coach who's grabbed his own player in an attempt to separate him. At this point, we have mass confrontation. We now have three individuals involved, and shortly, many more. It's impossible at this point to think that the referees will be able to keep this from escalating. So now, we need to back out and manage this appropriately. The fundamentals of managing mass confrontation revolve around the fact that referees cannot halt the behavior. You have two goals of mass confrontation. First, catch as many miscreants guilty of misconduct as you possibly can. And second, don't get hurt or involved yourself. A three-man crew should form a triangle around the confrontation, allowing peacemakers from the teams to get in and break up fights. As the players become separated, step in and move them to other areas of the field, ideally keeping players from each team away from each other. If you watch this confrontation develop, as chaotic as things seem, there are, in all truth, not that many people doing bad things. By this point, there are no fewer than 30 people in the camera frame, but only one problem area. The trouble is, it's a big problem area. We have opposing players on the ground at various stages of restraint and entanglement. What's worse, our senior assistant is on the ground with them trying to get them off one another. There are at least three or four people in this pile, and actually, most of them are just trying to break everything up. As a referee, you're not going to help this, and you might miss something when you're in so close. As that pile entangles, either on purpose or by accident, legs and arms start flailing again. A blue player stumbles backward onto the ground, 
And in an act of cowardice that defines this entire confrontation, the white goalkeeper charges up and kicks the down blue player, then runs away from the scene of the crime, pursued by one of the blue bench players. Actually, in all likelihood, the referee crew was fortunate that the goalkeeper chose to run. If the blue bench player had caught him, this entire situation might have blown up all over again. That kick was likely missed by the entire referee crew. The junior assistant had moved across the mass to successfully separate players. The referee was on the far side of the confrontation, but likely blocked from viewing this incident. And the senior assistant is still on the ground and is unnecessarily grabbing and dragging a white player out of the pile. Notably, an action to which that player and his teammates may not take too kindly to. Rule number two of mass confrontations, don't get hurt. If somebody turns around and cold cocks you because you're pulling on their arm, you're not going to be all that effective at remembering any numbers of players guilty of misconduct. We know full well that many officials feel it is their responsibility to get in there and break up fights. Newsflash, to those of you who think that, it's not. A referee's role in managing mass confrontation is either keep it from getting to that point in the first place, or if it does get to that point, catch everything you can so you can report the misconduct and ensure that the governing body for that game can take proper action afterward. Let's take a look at this incident and review what might have been done differently by this crew. First of all, the thing that sets it off is an apparently an innocent looking collision. Innocent, except that when you consider the players involved. Number 11 for White had been involved in the penalty area foul with 1.45 to play, getting pushed down, and then getting in the face of the blue player who fouled him. Even though that situation had been diffused apparently at the time, we're not in the clear. We need to know where number 11 is going to be the rest of the game. When number 11 throws the first punch, the referee did not see it and react accordingly, but he should have. Loud blast of the whistle, immediate presence is the third man in. Yes, we know he didn't see this break out because the ball had moved away, but as referees we need to sense where these problem players are and we need to linger our gaze on these folks even after the ball moves away from them. It's not just if the referee had been in before it escalated, but sharp loud whistles and a clear sense of urgency in the referee's body language would have sent a message to everybody on the field. I've got this. Nobody else do anything stupid. Once the players exchange blows, there's a short respite where the senior assistant referee has a chance to stop this. Understand who is responsible and isolate one or both players if you can. As mentioned previously, the assistant referee unfortunately moves between the wrong two people, number six and number 11, while he loses track of number two. This allows number two to come back around and engage number 11 again. The assistant referee has number 11 directly in front of him and he has the blue coach arriving on the scene. The assistant referee needs to trust the coach to grab his own player as this is happening in front of the blue bench and focus on separating the white player. Get him away from the bench, get him into the corner, whatever, just get him out of there. Once this blows up, we see the referee properly step back to begin observing. The senior assistant, however, doesn't. Much of the ensuing misconduct takes place on the touchline side of the confrontation and the referee and junior assistant's view are blocked by the mass of bodies. If we recognize this confrontation developing, we're going to form our triangle here. But we lose one of the points of our triangle and end up with an area of the confrontation that's completely unsupervised. Of course, this is where the worst moments of the confrontation happen. The kick by the goalkeeper is missed. A push by a pitch invader is missed. We need to be back in observing, not in the middle of the mixer missing these things. Most of our games aren't on TV, so if we don't see and report this behavior, nobody will. Finally, one more improvement specifically for the senior assistant. Don't touch the players. Here we see two blue players wrestling number 11 to the ground while the assistant is yanking on his arm. We don't separate players by trying to pull the shoulder out of their socket. If this player's hurt in this process, it really doesn't matter how this started. The assistant referee is opening himself up to rather some unpleasant post-game problems. This was not terrible mass confrontation management, but it wasn't great either. Let's commend the senior assistant for trying to be the third man in, even if he wound up separating the wrong two people. Let's also commend the referee for not diving into the mix and trying to separate anybody once it was blowing up. As we have said already, one or two referees are not going to solve this mess. 
The opposite assistant referee gets across the field quickly and successfully begins the separation process as he is supposed to. It's natural for us as officials to try to break up fights, but once a third person is involved, it's also fruitless. Our job is to catch and administer misconduct, and if we can't catch as much if we're in the middle of the confrontation, we need to back out. You have to believe that the majority of the participants in a confrontation are not there to cause problems, and you should let the peacemakers do their job. Honestly, look at the fact that this confrontation eventually ended. How much of that was due to the efforts of the referee crew?